Thanks for allowing me to present this video for the 2024 Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship Conference. I will show how the physical construction of the first folio provides clues to the identity of the real author. In doing so, I will discuss several typesetting anomalies in the first folio that help resolve the authorship issue. The construction of the first folio hides clues to the identity of the real author. The printer Isaac Jaggard saw to it that many of them were hidden in plain sight. As Robert Record said in the Whetstone of Wit from 1557, there are great hidden secrets in numbers, and it is in numbers that we find many clues. The catalog of plays, table of contents, is a major component of that strategy, yet it is not the powertrain of the folio's authorship engine. As George Watson Cole wrote in his paper, the first folio of Shakespeare, further word regarding the correct arrangements of its preliminary leaves, published in volume three of the Proceedings and Papers of the Bibliographic Society of America. The first edition of Shakespeare is a folio volume composed almost wholly of terniums, which are groupings of three sheets, each group consisting of six leaves or 12 pages. In a single instance, in the body of the work, the histories, there is a quaternion, a gathering of four sheets of eight leaves or 16 pages. The quaternion drives the gears in the authorship clues. When I first read this, I was reminded of the work of Dr. John Dee, in particular, the following from his book, Monas Hieroglyphica. Unde quaternarium? Hic demonstramus in tenario quiescentum. Translated, it reads, the quaternity is concealed within the ternary. Just as when three equilateral triangles form a fourth triangle when their points are joined, so too there is a hidden secret fourth element, the quaternion within a ternary. Quaternities contain profound secrets. This is both the Pythagorean and Rosicrucian mystery. We can therefore answer the question this quaternion poses. Why does the folio have a quaternion, a group of four sheets, or 16 pages, in the middle of a book made of ternions, groups of three sheets, or 12 pages? To allude to John Dee's Theorem 20, the quaternity is concealed within the ternary from his book Monus Hieroglyphica, and to let us know an important truth is hidden within the quaternion. To understand the quaternion, was, we must know where it is located. It begins on page 87 in second part of Henry IV at collation mark G, G. The last section begins on page 93 at collation mark G, G, 4. This is near the center of the book. It is followed by the misnumbered page for Henry V, which is at collation mark H. This mark is proof that Henry V was to be numbered at page 69 from the beginning when the folio was planned. The collation marks from the previous Turnian group follow the proper alphabetical order, but there is something astonishing about that page number. The page number matches that for Theorem 20 in the 1591 edition of Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica. This is as precise as a laser. This is also a perfect allusion to Theorem 20 in physical form. I consider this to be proof that the clues I will show exist. The page number is permanent, irrefutable, and clear evidence in favor of the authorship issue. Unless opponents want to disagree with the book's long-dead editors and compositors and the proof found on this page, they cannot refute its existence. Furthermore, the quaternion contains a profound truth, just like a quaternity does. But first we must get some bearings on the quaternion in relation to the catalog of plays. We begin and end our title count at the location of the quaternion. There are 17 titles listed before the location, 
there are 17 titles listed after the location. This imitates the structure of a Roman triumphal procession. As explained by Alistair Fowler in his book Triumphal Forms, Structural Patterns in Elizabethan Poetry, poets would place important ideas or events in the middle of their works to allude to the Roman emperor's position in the procession. The quaternion is located at the same place as the emperor. The first 17 titles represents the spoils and captives of war. The second 17 titles represent the generals, soldiers, and notable citizens who supported the emperor. The secret in the quaternion is just as important to the first folio as the emperor is to Rome. Now we have an answer to the long-standing question, why is Troilus and Cressida not listed in the catalog of plays? Adding it would disrupt the triumphal structure. Adding it would prevent readers from understanding the importance of the number 17. We can also answer, why are the poems excluded from the first folio? The answer is the same as for Troilus and Cressida. Adding them would disrupt the triumphal structure, and adding them would prevent readers from understanding the importance of the number 17. We will now look at the sight lines from the catalog's headpiece ornament. I believe they are necessary in understanding the authorship issue. The headpiece ornament and title are important in finding clues. Drawing lines from the figures inside it show us the way. Here is Eros on the left. Here is Heracles on the right. Juno is in the middle. Where do these archers point? Would sight lines on the page give us clues in the authorship issue? Here are the sight line targets from Eros, the Cali Greyhound below him, and the uppercase decorative initial T. They are the only figures which could conceivably point to significant items. As in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 2, Scene 2, Cupid all armed a certain aim he took, Eros points to the first page of the first part of Henry IV, while the Hound points to the first page for the first part of Henry VI. A sight line drawn from the decorative T points to the wrong page number for Henry V. I chose the decorative initial for the following reason. Notice that the top bar from the letter is not set level with the tops of the other letters in the title. It is set level to the bottom of the line of text, drawing attention to itself. The sight line clips the page number for Henry V. By elimination, this exposes the location of the quaternion. Now I will show you the discovery I made from the catalog of plays, which contributes to the authorship issue. The sight lines are crucial. Like finding a new type of archaeological artifact, it appears to be unique to the first folio. The catalog pages for Johnson's works from 1616 and Beaumont and Fletcher's folio from 1647 do not separate the plays into categories, nor do they have page numbers. This brings us to a question long posed by scholars. Why does each section begin on page one? It is believed that the folio was originally intended to be issued in three volumes. My discovery will provide a different reason. We can also ask why is the page number beginning Henry V wrong? It should not just be to allude to Theorem 20, otherwise it could be seen just as a peculiar coincidence. Let's look at the numbers in context. It is the only way to see what is really going on with these anomalous page numbers. Here are the first four Henry titles. The first page for Henry V should be page 101, not 69. It was while looking at this section on the page that I con concentrated my attention on the Henry Trilogy of the first and second parts of Henry IV and Henry V. While looking at this, I asked, why did the compositor begin Henry V on page 69? 
there must be another reason other than to direct attention to Theorem 20 in the Monas Hieroglyphica. Some readers would not have known about the book and missed the clue. Looking the section over one night several years ago, I stumbled upon something simple, yet startling. These three connected digits of 4, 6, and 7 add to 17. This is the number of plays listed before and after the location of the Quaternion. Many of you are probably already ahead of me in this, but indulge me for the sake of those who do not see the rest of the clues. This is a second permutation of numbers that add to 17, 6, 4, and 7. This permutation of 7, 4, and 6 also adds to 17. Finally, the vertical permutation of 4, 7, and 6 also adds to 17. What I had discovered seemed not to be random at all. So, we have four permutations of the numbers that add to 17. These two permutations, the 4, 7, and 6, and the 7, 4, 6 groups are why Henry V had to begin on page 69. That means we have enough clues to indicate these were meant to be there. It was just earlier this year that I noticed the following. They form a quaternary within a ternary because there are four permutations hidden within three digits and there are four permutations hidden within three play titles. That gives us three examples of a quaternity. The physical structure plus the two locations for the permutations. This satisfies the maxim tria sunt omnia or three is all. The lowercase letters for numbers in the titles for the Henry IV plays are hints to pay closer attention. They are the only numbers in the section set in lowercase. The page number for the first part of Henry VI is also a mirror of 69 for another hint. It was the first anomaly I looked at on the page which prompted me to investigate further. These are the rules for the clues. They have been reverse engineered from what we have already done. Rule one, you add individual digits. Merry Wives begins on page 38, while Measure for Measure begins on page 61. Three plus eight is 11, 11 plus six is 17. Rule number two, you can use digits more than once in sequential clues. Rule number three, the digits must touch each other horizontally and or vertically. Rule number four, the sum must be the target number 17. I discovered there are many more examples on the page. This is the first one on the page, the Merry Wives measure for measure clue we just saw. Here is a chart of the comedy's clues. The permutations beneath the arrows share the same three digits, three, six, and eight, for another example of Tria Sunt Omnia. I call these puzzles adding letters because as you solve them, you go down the page like rungs on a ladder until you reach the bottom of the page. This is the tragedy chart showing a perfect rung adding ladder in the page numbers for Othello and Anthony and Cleopatra because all six digits are used to get the target number. Here is a clever dual authorship clue in the history section. 173 plus 4 plus 2 equals 179 and 1 plus 7 plus 9 is 17. I discovered this gem just a few months ago. In total, there are 43 adding ladders according to my calculations. To the modern reader this means nothing, but to the contemporary readers of the folio it has a surprising significance. In the Latin alphabet repeating count code, which I call the LARC, the letter value of 43 is the pair VV. This is beginning to sound like someone is trying to say something here. Sometime after I found the adding ladders, I stumbled onto the bridges. This pair of digits from two gentlemen of Verona connects the comedies to the tragedies by the last two digits of Cymbeline. This set of digits from The Winter's Tale, King John and Richard II connects the comedies to the histories and to column two via the first digit from the first part 
of Henry IV. Finally, this set of digits from Henry VIII, Coriolanus, Titus Andronicus, and the first digit for Romeo and Juliet connects the histories to the tragedies. I had discovered something which defies chance. The plays are connected by the hidden number 17. Now there is a reason why each section begins on page 1. To create these numerical authorship clues is like the worm or a borrow seeding its own tail and reflects what Johnson said of the writer. He is for all time. Wait, there is more. Why is Cleopatra spelled incorrectly in the catalog of plays? It is spelled Cleopater for some reason, and boy does she look miffed. Notice the uppercase C is from a larger size typeface. Compare that to the uppercase C from the Comedy of Errors. Notice the spelling mistake in the title for the Comedy of Errors. After finding this, I ask whether the page number is another error. Going to my handy-dandy portable facsimile of the first folio, I discovered that it was. Which number is correct? The one in the catalog or the one in the text? The last page of Othello will let us know. Othello ends on page 339. That means the catalog entry is wrong. That led me to the next question. Is the page number for Othello correct? It begins on page 310, so yes, it is correct. Having looked at this odd puzzle, I can draw your attention to the Hamlet, Lear, and Othello enigma. This discovery was as unexpected as the adding ladders and is a significant breakthrough in knowing what is going on with the typesetting of the first folio. Here is the Lear Othello adding ladder. These digits form another perfect rung adding ladder. All six digits are used. The next question to ask is, is the entry for Lear correct? Yes, it is. But there is a catch. Hamlet's pagination goes from page 156 to 257, a jump of 100 numbers. What is going on? It turns out the question has a logical answer. The skip page numbers allowed the compositor to start Lear on page 283. Someone was paying extremely close attention to the page numbers to see to it that they create the adding ladder sums. We can therefore say these mistakes are intentional. Hamlet's skip page numbers allow Lear to begin on the correct page so that the perfect rung adding ladder would be created. Cleopatra's incorrect spelling draws readers' attention to the wrong page number so they would try and figure out what is going on. On to the secret heart of the first folio. These anomalies lead us to the secret heart of the first folio. We need to go over a bit of what we have seen before we can continue. Recall that the Quaternion begins on page 87 in the second part of Henry IV, and that the wrong page number of Henry V was no mistake, because it serves a particular function. The Quaternion alludes to this page from the 1591 edition of Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica via the wrong page for Henry V. That indicates the Quaternion contains a profound truth located in the epilogue to the second part of Henry IV. The headpiece ornament is once again the key as it is in the catalog. When I discovered this clue, I knew the Oxfordian theory was correct. There is no way that the following could have been created by chance typesetting. It is way too precise. Let's look at the internal sight lines for a moment. They are not too significant. Eros points to the tripod Juno is sitting on, while Heracles points to the gourd at her feet. 
what will the other sight lines present to us? The external sight lines are more promising. Notice that the sight line for arrows crosses the B and clips the second E in epilogue. Unfortunately for Heracles, he points only to the decorative initial F. Put Eros's targets in the back of your mind while we continue. To find the secret heart of the first folio, we need to see what the final sightline targets are for Eros and the Cali Greyhound below him. They are perhaps the most significant in the authorship issue. Here is the target number one from Eros. The word is. Here is the target two from the hound. The word this. As Alice would say, curiouser and curiouser. What I found was a partial rhyme which led me to ask, could this be a word acrostic? I figured that they were the first and last words in some puzzle which had to be figured out. The answer is, yes, it could. These six words are what we will work with. But this doesn't make sense. Is will purpose very patient this is not proper grammar. A correct solution to a cryptogram should be grammatically correct and make sense. This direction from the bottom to the top seems to improve the grammar but there is still something wrong. In the authorship game, as I have discovered it, we can remove items from a group if they are different from the majority. We can therefore remove the words beginning with uppercase letters, patience and purpose, like so. The grammar is now corrected. This very will is more logical. But what is this very will? If we continue to go upward, we see a colon, a comma, a Cali Greyhound, a vine, and perhaps a hare. That still doesn't make sense. Let's see what happens when we follow the logic. We have gone from the bottom word to the top word. What happens when we travel backward along Eros's sight line? This happens. Presenting what I call the secret heart of the first folio, the word acrostic, this very will is E dot B. Let's clarify that. This very will is E dot B. The quaternion in the first folio has led us to this clue. There can be no doubt it is about the authorship of the play since the message is grammatically correct and makes sense. The location of the Quaternion imitates the place a Roman emperor would have in a triumphal procession, which means it is as important to the folio as the emperor is to Rome. That in turn leads to Theorem 20 in Dies Monas Hieroglyphica via the wrong page number for Henry V. Those illusions, in turn, lead us to the most logical place for another clue, the epilogue to the second part of Henry IV. In my opinion, there can be no clearer, more definitive statement about the real author than this. It is located in, within the Ur document of the Shakespearean canon, and there is no more authoritative document than that. The word very is also a pun on the real author's surname, as we now know. This adds another link in our chain of evidence. There is a meaningful number of characters, 17, for another strong link. We then add the gematria sum of the uppercase letters to the remaining number of characters to see what we get. This is what we get. The sum is 40. This is yet another 1740 illusion, which the late Alexander Waugh was fond of pointing out in his videos. The number of authorship clues in this acrostic is three, and they are too precise to be randomly created.
I always want to find something for the skeptics to think about. Ideally, I would like it to be irrefutable and easily understood so they clearly get the point. Look carefully at the paragraphs, especially paragraph one. There is something odd. Note the raised period after venture. It is positioned at the exact center of the lowercase e rather than the base of the line. It is located at the visual center of the paragraph. Notice the white space in paragraph one. There are many more spacers in the paragraph than the other two paragraphs. The largest are M spacers in red. The next largest are the N spacers as in Nancy. And the smallest are half N spacers. They have a specific function. They push the required words for the acrostic to the right hand margin, making them N targets for arrows and the hound. This is not all I wanted to show skeptics. I wanted something external to this book. Therefore, I went to the next edition, the second folio, to see what the printer did with this epilogue. This is what he did, showing the same sight lines as in the first folio. Notice that almost every element is identical. They are not quite the same, but close. These three words, very, will, is, is evidence the printer Thomas Coates was attempting to duplicate the word acrostic in the first folio. He used the same ornament, the same size typefaces, and similar line spacing, but he did not fully succeed. It was a valiant effort on the part of the compositor. The preposition this makes all the difference between a grammatically correct message and a partial message. The rest of the message makes more sense since it points to this will, the man whose name is on the title page, as a pen name. Here's the question for scholars. What does this mean for other authorship candidates? Summing up the evidence. There is a quaternion in the folio, which is a physical allusion to Theorem 20 in the 1591 edition of John Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica. The number of titles listed in the catalog of plays before and after location of the quaternion is 17. The location of the quaternion is the same as a Roman emperor would have in a triumphal procession. Troilus and Cressida was not included in the catalog, so it would not disrupt the triumphal structure. There are 43 adding letters, clues, and three bridge clues in the catalog which connect the plays by a hidden number 17. When the catalog puzzles are discovered, some long-standing anomalies and enigmas in the typesetting of the first folio are now resolved, such as Hamlet skip page numbers and the wrong spelling of Cleopatra in the catalog. The quaternion hides a word acrostic identifying the real author of the plays. This very will is E dot V is unambiguous, clear, and sharp evidence needed for the Oxfordian theory to succeed. In conclusion, the first folio's physical construction provides clues that the name on the title page is not that of the real author, but Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, was the real author. This is strong evidence that Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, was Shakespeare. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.